And the New Testament is more, just, more than just a white page between the two uh, testaments that I began to read the word and I began to see how Satan had spoiled me, how I could read something like Galatians 3.13 and it says very clearly that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. And I could have read that, but philosophy and vain deceit had crowded my mind so much that I didn't even comprehend what it was really saying. It's saying that we're redeemed from the curse of the law. We're redeemed from all of those curses. And I read that and it didn't, you know, I didn't really comprehend it. I, I, it was always, we're redeemed from the curse, but, you know, but I'm not supposed to be prosperous, but I'm not supposed to be, you know, it would always blind our minds. It says, it blind my mind. And it said, um, in first Corinthians that Satan has blinded the uh, world. Now there's a particular test, a psychological test called the ink block test where they take a picture of what it looks like just a splash, and this is a you know, very rudimentary explanation, but they take a picture of, a, of an ink blot, what is like a really random picture, and they'll ask two different people, what does this picture mean to you? And depending on where you are mentally, you'll see two totally different things. So we'll have one person who, you know, is an uh, optimist who's positive, and they'll say, oh, that looks like flowers. Uh, there, that's flowers in a meadow, and they'll see something very positive. But someone who can see the exact same picture can look at the exact same picture and see darkness. Oh, I see evil, and I see those are dark thunderclouds, and they'll see something completely different. And I was like, that, maybe that's what happened with us when we all, we all read the same Bible. It was not a different Bible that, you know, it hasn't changed. The word of God lasts forever. It's going to stand forever. But we all look at the same Bible, and I know for a fact that we looked at it before, and we came away with the thought that God was a vicious God, that God was a, an angry God, that he, was, uh, that he would kill anybody who, was, who stood against his judgment. I was uh, watching TV for a moment there um, last week, and I watched this, uh, Bill Maher. He's like a really famous uh, atheist, and he was talking about... Um, how could this be a real God who was so bloodthirsty and so violent? And he, you know, his description of the word of God was quite offensive to me, but that's how he saw it. And he read the same Bible that I read, that I come away and I think I understand that my God is a loving God. My God is an awesome God. He, he looks for opportunities to bless me, that he came and he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. This is the same God that I read about, but he take, took that same Bible and he read it and he came away thinking that this is a a vicious, bloodthirsty, angry God. So how do we make sure that we don't get our philosophy uh, confused with what the world is preaching, with what the world is sending us? Because there are times, um, they say that uh, children or young people, when they're sent off to college, that that can be such a dangerous time in their life. They could be raised as a Christian all of their life. But then they go and they attend these philosophy classes and they attend these other classes, classes that attend these other classes that make them begin to question what they've been taught from the time that they were born. And they begin to look at things and, and view things in a different way. And by the time they graduate out of college, they don't even believe that there is a God anymore because they've been exposed to these vain philosophies. They've been exposed to these deceits. And we know in the Bible it says that we are supposed to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the mind of Christ and bring it into subjection. But if we are not at war, if we are not on guard, and we're sitting here, you know, I, I love to learn. I love to hear about new things. I love to understand new things. But at all times, when I'm learning something, when I'm picking up a book, I'm very, very, very particular about what I read. I'm very particular about the things that I listen to. I listen to a lot of ministry on YouTube, but I mean, they got about five minutes before I'm switching it off. If it's anything contrary to what I know the Word of God says, if it's anything that says anything against the fact that my God is a loving God, my God is a, a, he's not an angry God, that he's not angry with me, that he's not looking for opportunities to sabotage me. If, there, if there's anything that's preaching condemnation or preaching uh, things like that, I turn it off. I don't want any parts of it. So I try to listen to people who are friends or, or who, who, who minister with people that I listen to so that I know that I'm, I'm not feeding myself anything outside of what I know is to be the truth of the word of God because it happens so subtly. It happens so, you know, again, Satan does not always come roaring. He does not always come in an obvious way. Um, there is a, um, so often uh, we read, like in the New Testament, we have the stories about Jesus that says, um, you know, well, the world is so determined to believe that Jesus was a poor man and that it's our lot to be poor and that it's more honorable for the man of God to be a poor man. And so they read scriptures that talk about that the Son of Man had no place to lay his head 
That means he must have been so poor and broke that he didn't have any, he couldn't afford a place to stay. But it just said he had no place to lay his head. I just moved out of my mama's house. I had no place to lay my head. We were not broke. That wasn't the situation. We just didn't have our own place. And that was God, the same, same situation for Jesus. It wasn't that he didn't have, he had a treasurer. You don't need a treasurer to count pennies. So obviously he had some kind of finances. Um, again, in Luke 2 and 7, uh, we, well, every time around Christmas time, it is impossible to avoid a Christmas card that has three little wise men with three little teapots full of gold, frankincense, and myrrh because we are content. Satan has blinded the minds of the world to believe that these three wise men traveled almost a thousand miles to see a king and to give him a little teacup full of myrrh, a little teacup full of frankincense, a little teapot cup full of gold. That is what he wants us to believe, that God, that Jesus was poor. Again, even when he was born, that he was born in a manger, it specifically says that he uh, was born in a manger because there was no room in the inn, not because they could not afford a room, but it's a, this was at a time where uh, everybody had come to be counted. Uh, the king was taking a census because he was trying to get Jesus caught up. And so during that time, everybody had come to there and, and the ends were all full and there was no place for him to lay. But let the world tell it. Let, and these beautiful, beautiful stories that we see on TV, they're so subtle. They're so very subtle. But you watch them again and again. Every Easter, every Christmas, they show the same thing. And they begin to brainwash us and make us believe that this was the truth for us. And we, instead of reading what the Word of God says, we begin to believe what these Bible stories say, that what Hollywood has produced. And somehow they've been brainwashed too because they read the same Bible that we read. And they come away with somehow understanding that Jesus was broke. Um, that the wise men, when I think about the king, the queen of Sheba, when she came to honor, um, when she came to honor Solomon, she had tons, she came with what comparably billions of dollars worth of gold, silver, raiment, precious oils to honor the king. Now here they came, and this was the king of Israel. They came, these wise men, and we, we generally it said it's three, but we don't know that it's three because the Bible doesn't say it's three. It could have been the whole, these, and these were wealthy, well-off men that had traveled a thousand miles almost on camel. And, and why would they come this far to honor, to show their worth? Because already their sacrifice that they made to come and follow the star and see the king had showed their worth of the king, had showed how they honored him. To come that far and to bring him a, a small little trinket? You don't travel that far to bring trinkets. So they brought him wealth. They brought him things that would allow them to be well off so that, the, uh, so that Mary and Joseph would be able to raise Jesus in the manner that he should be accustomed to so that he could be raised uh, and be trained so that he could be the son of God. So oftentimes we see that um, Jesus is seen as poor, but that's not, our, that's not our lot in life because the Bible also says that he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. He came that we might have life and that more abundantly. Again, we read the same Bible and we come away. If we believe what the Bible says, if we read it for what it is and not for what we've been taught. Again, I've been taught so many times, so many things that I've listened to because I didn't pick up the Bible for myself and I just listened and heard uh, what what was the common teachings. Um, it says in the Bible that uh, the traditions and doctors of men um, make the word of God of null effect. So we would read this with blinders on. We would read this and we could only see what we had been taught. So we have to read it through what we had been um, taught previously and we couldn't see past that. Um, I've been told the story of a woman who at one, uh, she, would, she would watch her mother cook as they were growing up, and her, every time she saw her mother make a roast, she saw her mother cut like an inch off of the roast, and she would put it in the pan and put it in the oven. Every single time, she cut an inch, inch off of the roast and put it in the oven and put it in a pan. And, you know, for sentimental reasons, she always did the same thing. You know, as an adult, she would cook, and she would cut off the inch and put it in the pan. And finally, you know, her husband said, Honey, why do you do that? And she said, Well, let me ask my mother. And she asked her mother, and her mother said, well, baby, it didn't fit in the pan. You know, we are doing things and we don't really understand 
what our motivation is. We don't really understand why we believe what we believe and we just taking things at face value when we have to begin to understand things for ourselves. If somebody gets sick or if somebody's in poverty, we accept it and we not only do we accept it, we begin to make excuses for it and we begin to make it fit the doctrines uh, that we've been taught. Well, maybe it's the will of God. We, we take the word of God and we bend it and we fold it until it fits our philosophies, until it fits what we've been taught. And the next thing you know, we've distorted the word of God. And that's, and by distorting the word of God, Satan has spoiled us. Because if I believe that it was God's will for this person not to be healed, I have spoiled them of their healing. I have literally spoiled them. They won't be healed because not only do I believe it, when I pray for you, I can't pray in faith. I'm praying in unbelief because I think that there's a chance that it's not God's will for you to be healed. When airplanes crash, when a, a plane crashes, the TSA does this big investigation and what do they look for in the crash? They always look for the black box because in that black box we have the data recorder and, the, and the, 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 there are two different kind of recorders in there and they know that this plane was not intended to crash. This was not supposed to crash so there must be a reason why this plane crashed. So when they look at that black box, they began to review the events that happened prior to the crash to see if they can find an explanation for why that happened. I can look back on my own life personally, and there have been crashes in my life, and I can see where if I look at the black box, if I begin to examine what happened that brought me to this devastation or what, had, what allowed me to be defeated in this situation, if I listen to my black box, I realize that I had exposed myself to false doctrine, that I had not gotten in the word of God for myself, that there were things that culminated and allowed me to believe something that was not uh, in line with the word of God. And so I set myself up for a crash, but there is a reason for it. There is an explanation. And I don't, long as, you know, they're not just going to say, well, maybe, you know, this plane wasn't made, this plane was made to crash. That, that's never the situation. And we have to understand anytime we're not receiving the blessings of God, anytime we don't receive the favor of God, anytime we don't receive what God says is rightfully ours, what Jesus died for us to have, we need to examine our black box. We need to find out what brought us to this point where we believe what we believe. There is a fallacy somewhere and we cannot continue to accept it. And then when we accept it, we pass this on generation to generation. I know I believe what I believe because this is what my mother taught me and this is what my, the generations before me taught. You know, And so this begins to be a curse, but I've been redeemed from the curse. So how do I get beyond the curse when I know that I've been redeemed, first of all, it's the awareness that I've been redeemed from the curse. Just that knowledge right there makes me start to study more and start to get in the word of God and say, maybe there's something wrong with what I know. That, what, that if I look in the word of God, that I can change my philosophy. I can change what I believe so that I can understand how I can receive what God has for me. Praise God. I promise I'm going to get a printer one day. <laughs> and with that in mind, it's so important that we study to show ourselves approved, that we rightly divide the word of truth. We have to know in whom we believe, not our mother's God, not our father's God, not our pastor's God. And pa he'll tell you, we have to know this for ourselves. I'm not a real big fan of that, um, know Jesus as your personal savior, but in reality, we have to know him for ourselves. I can't go to heaven on anybody else's back or on your, your blessing or on your salvation. I need to know him for myself. That means I've got to open up the word of God and I begin to test it against what I've known to be true. And if it's not true, then my philosophy has to change because I'm tired personally. I'm tired of being spoiled by the devil. I'm tired of me not receiving everything that God has for me. There is literally a cutoff point in my life where I didn't believe that I could be successful or prosperous. Before I understood that that was my lot, that that's what God had for me, that that is genuinely the reason why he died, I didn't even look for it. I had, you know, I was comfortable and satisfied with just enough. But oh my God, I found out that that's not his lot for me. That is not his plan for me. He did not give his son so that I could be satisfied with mediocre. I messed around and found out that he wants me to have abundance. He came that I might have life and that more abundantly, not just ordinary, but he wants to be extraordinary to me. What did I find out that for? Because now my perception, my, my pursuit in life is to see all that God has for me. I know too much to be mediocre anymore. You know, and there comes a point when we begin to sound a little arrogant to the bystander. There, there comes a time when somebody who, who doesn't understand my faith or doesn't understand that it's to God be the glory, they may think that I'm being arrogant or conceited, but I know very well 
that I am above and not beneath. I know that I'm, I'm born to prosper. I'm born to have abundance, not because of anything that I do. If anything, it's because of everything that he's done. When we go back to uh, the way that Jesus spoiled uh, um, the enemy, uh, there's a story uh, that talks about Israel when they were uh, being besieged and they were eating their young and they were, you know, they had eaten everything. They were eating dung. You know, the enemy was not going to stop. Satan won't stop until he has you eaten dung, until you are down to nothing. But in that same way, Jesus came, hallelujah, in the same way God set it up so that so all he needed was somebody who said, what if there's more? And those three lepers had the nerve to believe that maybe what, what if there's more? And they, they went over there and they said, well, you know what, what could happen if I perish, if we perish, whatever, you know, if I stay here, I'll die. If I go there, I'll die. So they just had the nerve to have a little bit of faith to go see what, what, what would be there. And they went through to that camp, and geez, God made it sound like it was a whole army approaching that camp so that the enemy ran and left everything. They never had to raise a sword. They never had to fight. That's how God wants to fight for us so that we don't ever have to sweat. We don't have, he wants to give us sweatless victory. And all he needs is for somebody to say, what, what will happen if I just believe exactly what the word says? He just wants somebody who, who will dare to believe who will step out and say you know what the worst thing that could happen is I'll be right back where I was but what if God actually does what he said he's going to do praise God second Timothy chapter 2 again says study to show thyself approved unto God uh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth verse 16 says but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness now, I've, I've been in Pentecost, I've been in the uh, organization where we weren't allowed to have TVs and we weren't allowed to uh, go to movies and we weren't allowed to play cards. And I was having this conversation with somebody at work and we weren't allowed to wear red. I mean, no, that wasn't our church, but you know, there's so many man-made constrictions and, con you know, confinements. One of the definitions of spoil, you know, it says, be careful lest any man spoil you. That means take you captive. And I can give my testimony because I have been captive. I've been captive to thinking that if I wore pants, I was going to hell. I've been captive to thinking that if I wore jewelry, I was going to hell. I was captive. That was my philosophy. And I love my dresses, but I wear them now because I want to, not because I'm captive anymore thinking that I have to. So now there's a freedom in knowing that, that that's not, God is not a petty God. That's not who he is. And so I, I grow in this freedom. But I had to study to show myself approved. I had to get in the word of God and begin to know him for myself. And I didn't, I started to ignore the vain babblings. Because if the vain vain babblings are telling me anything in opposition to what the word of God says, then I can't listen to that anymore. And I have to, do, you know, you build a relationship with God when you've been doing this and you realize, you know what, oh God, you still love me? Even when I do this and even when I do that, you still love me? There's no, there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And what I understand now is not so much that now I can do whatever I want to do, but the Holy Ghost is teaching me the right, the right way. The Holy Ghost is teaching me to live godly. And now it's just a walk and I begin to renew my mind and God and I, we walk in the still of the day, still in the cool of the morning, you know, and we're just walking and he's fellowshipping with me and I'm fellowshipping with them. And he said, baby, maybe you shouldn't do that anymore. Or, you know, that's not really what I have for you. And that's how he's teaching me, not having me bound up and having me sitting in condemnation because I'm scared that this was going to send me to hell. I t I've told y'all my testimony many, many times, but I got, I give God glory because the, who the son has set free, he is free indeed. And there's so many things I do. I live godly now because I want to. That I, I was, you know, sitting around and I turned on the TV and I'm like, I don't even know what's going on TV anymore. I don't, you know. I don't know Tyler Perry's anything. I don't know what's going on because I just don't want to. He didn't, I didn't, you know, pastor doesn't say, you know, you're not supposed to have TV. We got four TVs, praise God, but I don't watch them that much because that's not what, that's not what I want to do. Somehow, God has brainwashed me in such a, to such a way that I have been brainwashed, uh, washed in the blood. My mind has been washed, uh, he, the renewing of the mind by the word of God, to so that I believe what the word of God says, and I begin to act out. I'm, I'm who he wants me to be now, not because I'm restricted or because I'm bound, but because I'm at peace, and he's leading me this way. He leads me beside still waters. He does not force me. He does not force anything on me. He does not. There's no straitjacket in God. I am free, praise God. And if I wasn't free, there are people that have received God who are believers, who are tongue-talking believers that are still smoking, still drinking. And there are times in my life, I remember a time 
I was at work uh, in, in Chicago, and one of the people, one of the church members came in, and she had on pants. And I mean, I couldn't, I could barely ring her up because I was just so, I mean, and this was literally, you know, I can look at it now and I think it's funny, but I was so bound that I was like, man, she's supposed to be saved. That's how bound I was. But I know that that's not the God we serve, but vain philosophies, these deceit, deceits have convinced me that that's the way it was supposed to be, that by live, the things that I wore and the things that I, uh, yeah, the things that I wore and so many of the things I did, he saved me and he died for all of my sins. He died for all of my sins, and I thank God for the revelation of that. And now I know that I live holier now than I ever did when I was bound by condemnation. So many times we have misconceptions concerning the heart of God, the nature of God, the grace of God. And when we fail to rightly divide the word of truth, we can take any part of the Bible and make it say what you want it to say if you want it to. And there are times you, re you see people um, who believe certain things, like I was talking about, um, they, uh, there was a church that literally their women, women couldn't wear red. How would God, how is he going to prevent you from wearing red? It's the red blood that cleansed my white, my black soul and, and made me white as snow. So, you know, he used the scarlet rope that uh, Rahab used as representing uh, the blood that would save us in the future. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> so Hebrews 4 says that we have to labor to enter into the rest. And um, I was watching, there's this um, a neuro, a, a Christian neurosurgeon, her name is uh, Carolyn Leif, Leif, and she talks about um, how renewing the mind, uh, she, she's very practical in it because she is, you know, she studies how the brain works and how uh, the things, mindsets and strongholds are developed in the mind and how these uh, different things can be uh, uh, changed and uh, new habits can de be developed if you repeat things if you do things for 21 days you can break a habit and if you do it do it for another 21 days so th three sets of 21 days can re can break a habit and replace it with a better habit uh, I was just talking to sister Willis just now and she I'm noticing how she's losing weight and we were just talking about how many times that um I've lost weight and gained weight and lost weight and they come find me again and again because I didn't change the process. I just dieted. I did something that caused me to lose weight, but I didn't maintain that. I didn't make a lifestyle change. So it takes, it takes a, a renewing of the mind. It's something that you have to do every day. It's something that you have to change your lifestyle to, and allow God to change your lifestyle because he'll do that. He'll gently, he'll start to turn you. He doesn't need you to be uh, 180 degrees from the left to the right he did he changed your spirit on the inside 180 degrees now he wants to work and gently just renew your mind daily every day start to get you a little closer to what uh he wants you to be in christ but he's already very pleased with you he put all of his his dissatisfaction all of his anger all of his wrath was poured out into on jesus when he was on the cross and now he can be pleased with you and now we are restored our relationship is restored with him and we're renewed in christ so that we can just have this relationship and this fellowship with god uh, that's why why he sent his son so we could be restored in relationship with him and as we begin to be restored in relationship we just begin to know more about him he just begins to refill himself you know me and my husband we've grown so so much closer but there'll still be times that he'll t he'll talk to me about somebody you know Ricky I'm like no I don't know Ricky we, but we've been together we've been so long he starts to think that I know everybody he knows and I start to think didn't I tell you because we just been fellowship and it's been 11 years now that but in the beginning <laughs> I told you after the after our honeymoon I didn't even like him very much so I know that God has just continued to work on him and likewise it wasn't all him praise God but it, in in 11 years my relationship with my husband has grown and I'm crazy about that man but that's how relationships grow when we get to fellowship we, be, we begin to fellowship with God he'll just take us and you know he'll just begin to talk to us softly and at first you can't really hear him real real well but if you just start to tune in and just start to listen and that will begin to renew your mind and that will begin to change the way that you think about so many things so that God's will will be uh, manifested in your life but um, uh, I'm sorry Romans 12 and 2 says that we have to be uh, renew renew our mind uh, by the word of God so that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God which means that if we do not renew our mind we cannot prove what is that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God we will not manifest the will of God in our lives we cannot show forth the praises of God without renewing our minds to what God has for us so we have to begin to think like God um, 
the Philippians 2 5 says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who thought it not a robbery to uh, put himself equal to God now we know that um, we're so letting it means that we have to allow it to happen we have to let this mind we have to um, we have to phys we have to um, do that actively allow this mind to be in us which is in Christ Jesus and I thought it interesting that when I looked up the word let uh, in, in British and in England when they say they're letting something that's like they're renting something they're renting an apartment so they'll say I'm going to the landlord will let his apartment for a, a one year lease so possibly is that what God why God said we have to let this mind because we literally have to rent out space to God and allow him to inhabit our minds so that we begin to think like him. We have to let this mind be us that which is in Christ Jesus. We have to let the mind of Christ begin to inhabit us by reading the word of God and letting it fill us up, letting it let it let it um, inhabit our minds so that this is what we begin to think. We begin to think like Christ and these things begin to come naturally to us. Um, so as we begin to renew our minds, we break the strongholds. Uh, again, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 uh, talks about these strongholds that we have to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself. But I believe just as these strongholds are present, that we can begin to uh, establish a godly stronghold. We can have positive strongholds. Uh, when I looked up the definition of stronghold, it talks about it being a defense, that it's a fortress. That is something that we have to, uh, that is something that we have um, built up on the inside of us that has to be torn down brick by brick. But I believe that we can have positive strongholds, strongholds where you, I, I know I've said it many times, you can't convince me that it's not always God's will to heal. I believe that that's a stronghold in me that I've allowed to be a positive stronghold, that it's become such a fortress and such a defense in me that I don't care if, I'm not going to speak anything negative, but if, if everybody down the block fall out, I know that it's still God's will to heal. I don't care if everybody at DMH, St. Mary's, and, and all the hospitals in Springfield fall out. I am convinced it's a stronghold in me that it's always God's will to heal. So when I begin to create these strongholds, they're based on what the Word of God says about me. <coughs> I don't know. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I promise I'll get it. My Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I have lost my mouse on my screen. Lord Jesus. That is crazy. Well, Praise God. I got some handwritten notes and I got what the word of God is telling me. So um, we know that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And I think sometimes if we understand how valuable this is and we'll understand that there is need for security over our mind. There is a need for us to uh, have uh, things built up around us. Uh, the, in Fort Knox, that's where they keep all the gold reserves for, um, for the United States. Those are our gold reserves. That's what our... Uh, that's what our uh, money system is based on, however firm that is. But I read about some of the things that, uh, this, uh, found that this Fort Knox is protected by. They have 25-ton blast, blast, blast-free doors, doors that you cannot blow up. They're 25 tons heavy. Uh, they have um, scanner cameras that can detect who you are by scanning your face. They have uh, barbed wire. They have... Uh, helicopters that fly over uh, the Fort Knox. They have all of these things that defend Fort Knox because what they have in there is very, very valuable. At last count, it was $270 million, $70 billion worth of gold uh, in Fort Knox. So that's very valuable. But again, the Word of God says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. If we understand how valuable what we have on the inside of us is, then maybe we will begin to uh, uh, be vigilant, be uh, beware, be on guard of what we have in our minds so that Satan can't come and spoil us, so that we can't hear propaganda, so we can't, we literally believe things that we hear repeatedly, whether they are true or not. That's how, you know, advertisements work. They continue to uh, reiterate the same thing. I was listening to Pandora the other day.
other day. And if you don't, you know, I don't pay for the one where you get rid of the commercial. So they have that same commercial over and over again. And by the end of it, I was like, maybe that is an app that I should download because I had heard the same. <laughs> and I really, when I, I, if I had enough space on my phone, I would have downloaded it because I'd heard it like six, seven times during listening to music. And I started to believe that, hmm, that's a good idea. But so many things that Satan has blinded us to is just because we continue to hear it again and again till we start to believe it. Not necessarily that it's true or that it lines up with the word of God, but if you hear, if you go, if you hear it at home at your church and they preach it and then you go to another church and they're preaching it and then you go and you turn on the TV and they're preaching it, even if it's not the word of God, we'll, we'll start, well, you know what? Everybody can't be wrong, you know, but we can't be that way about the word of God. Uh, Amos, Amos, Amos chapter 7, verse 1, 1 through 3. It says, thus hath the Lord shown unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shoots up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And it came to fast, pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, that I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob rise? That is not the right verse. There is a scripture in Amos. God's will be done. There's a scripture in Amos that refers to the plumb line. And the plumb line was something. They didn't have the levelers that we use. I use this leveler because I was putting up pictures at, at work, you know, to make sure and that my, my uh, picture was level. But in the uh, Bible, it talks about a plumb line, that it's something that you measure everything by. And the word of God has got to be our plumb line. It has to be what we measure everything that we hear by. It has to line up with the word of God. Um, David was someone who, um, even though he had at the time... He, I read about, uh, we talked about in Samuel where he had his guard down and temptation was allowed to get in. But the beautiful thing about uh, David was that he had a, uh, he was a man after God's own heart. He began to understand that what God, he began to understand it was more than the law. It was more than um, these, uh, the sacrifices and things like that. That was not the heart of God. That was not the true heart of God. He understood, you know, in uh, Psalm uh, not in Psalm 8, I believe in Psalm 51, that sacrifices were not uh, what he really wanted, that he wanted a, con a contrite heart, a broken spirit was what he really wanted of us. And if we, can t if we just make ourselves humble to the word of God, if we submit ourselves, if we cast down every high thought that is against the knowledge of God and we just begin to feed on what the word of God says about us and that becomes our reality, then God will begin to manifest. Pardon? Amos 7 and 7. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's in there. Uh, Satan is busy, but I know what the word of God says. And I know that we, when we line up our word, what we believe with what the word of God says, that we can't go wrong. You really, literally can't go wrong with following the word of God. And there are things in the world. I've talked to, um, you have conversations with um, people who, and I, I mean, homosexuality is just such an obvious thing, so it keeps coming up. But you, I've talked talk to people who, who consider themselves gay, and they're, you know, they're not trying to openly oppose God. They, in their, they sincerely believe I was born this way. They sincerely believe that this is the way I'm supposed to be. They're not just, you know, you know there are people who, consider, who are saved but feel like it's their right to be gay. But it's, it's a, just another sin. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a stronghold of the mind. Um, this man, he was actually uh, testifying about being brought out of, of that lifestyle. And he said that for him, homosexuality had been like a dog that you walk every day. You feed this dog every day. You pet it every day. You take it with you every day. Some days you let it sleep with you to the extent that when you become renewed of the mind, you still have this pet. Or when you, when you get saved, you still have this pet that's been a part of your life. It's been like a member of the family. You, can't, you don't just break that stronghold overnight because you're not living it as if, you know, I'm sinning and I'm feeling convicted. They're living, they feel this way and it's in, in freedom, feeling like it's the right thing to do. So how do we love on people but still let them know what the word of God says? We don't bring condemnation. We don't make them feel bad. If somebody came, if a homosexual came in here or if a drunk or anybody who is obviously a sinner, so to speak, came in, we will love them with the love of God. We're going to hug on them. We're 
we're going to welcome them because they need to know what the word of God says. And they're not going to hear what I have to say if I'm coming to them in condemnation. They're not going to hear what I have to say if I'm looking at them and I'm saying, well, you don't really look like what a Christian should look like. What should a Christian look like? Anybody know? Because we look all different. Sometimes we wear church hats, sometimes we wear skirts to our ankles, pants, whatever. What does a Christian look like? I, I, look, I look into the mirror of the word of God, and I let the word of God, I begin to look more like him every day. That's my mirror. When I look in the word of God, I fix my hair, I fix my dress, I begin to make, let the word of God show me what I'm supposed to look like, and he begins to change me that way. So we just have to stay in the word of God. And I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to my notes, but I believe... <laughs> That y'all are getting what I'm trying to say. The word of God has to be our plumb line. That has to be our guide. And if we don't submit to what the word of God said, Satan will come subtly. He will come subtly with quiet, just little things. Hath God said? Because what he did to Adam when they were, they were made in the image of and they were made in the image of God. And he had them believing that they didn't have everything that they already had. And as long as we don't know what we have, as long as we don't understand what's all right, then we will not receive all that God has for us. We, there are parts of the blessing, like I said, that we don't take advantage of. We don't get to uh, have in our lives because we don't believe in it. And if you don't believe it's yours, you won't have it. If you don't believe that it's yours, that it's your right, then you won't have it. The first step is believing that it's possible. You know, I have to understand that this is what God has for me and he will begin to change my mind and renew my mind to the extent that when I pray for healing or when I pray for prosperity or when I sow for these things. Matter of fact, one of the things that's another, uh, one of the things that Satan has used to blind the church, to blind the minds of the uh, people of God is uh, prosperity in the church or prosperity for the ministers. Um, the prosperity preachers, uh, they've been condemned by the church and we begin, you know, even the, the body, church body rejects that as being something unnatural or something wrong if we see a minister who has wealth. That's the, that's the man of God. If we, we, it's important to us, it says, I believe in 1 Corinthians, it says that he gave us, he gave seed to the sower. So how am I going to have seed to sow if I don't have anything? Now he gave us, he gives it to us abundantly so we can sow seed and still have enough left over to take care of our but if I'm if people are coming to church and we need we have people who are coming and we have to feed them before they'll even hear us we have to take care of them before they'll even hear what the Word of God says because they can't hear us over their stomach growling so we need to prosper the church needs to prosper and the church we have to prosper by the Word of God we're not gonna prosper by selling chicken dinners we're not gonna prosper no disrespect, Lord forgive me. We're not going to prosper by bake sales and things like that. We are going to prosper because we're givers. The Bible said we're going to prosper because we go by the, the concepts of what the word of God says. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over shall men give into your bosom. If I need something, if I need a house, I need to pay somebody's rent. I need to sow into somebody else so that I can receive a harvest. God is a God of seed, time, and harvest. Now, we believe the, the concept, Satan has spoiled us of that because he's made us believe that we're, we're supposed to have, we have to fight for, we have to work for, we have to work overtime and weekends and so on and so forth. But we saw how uh, God, God gets the spoil to the people um, in the story of Je Jehoshaphat. I believe in 2 Corinthians 20, it talks about how he had, they had the choir go out first and they started giving God praise to so by the time they got over the hill, God had spoiled them, had confused them so much that they beat each other's tail and they were all they, they, all they saw was nothing but spoil left. That's how God wants to bless us. They did not have to raise a finger. All they did, what did they do to fight? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. They, it took them three days to carry away the spoil. That's what God wants for us. That's how he wants to prosper us. That's how he wants to bless us. Not for us having to struggle and toil more. That's why Hebrews talks about that we have to labor to enter into the rest. And I was talking about Carolyn Leif and how she studies all these different things. She literally said that the, it is literally work for you to renew your mind. So that's what the labor is. It's not, it's a sweatless labor. Labor. It's where we just have to sit still and make up our mind that every morning for the first month, I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to meditate on God. And once I became, and once I make that a habit, then I'm going to try 10 minutes. I'm going to get up 10 minutes early and I'm going to meditate on God until that begins to, you know, that renews my mind all day that God is in everything that I do. Uh, we're, there are things that I do now, you know, at work, we have to get contracts. We have to fill out paperwork. We're dealing with legal things. God wants to be a part of all of that. If I just open the door and let him in that, it's not sweatless. I mean, people could, we had somebody call the other day 
day and say, yeah, I looked up your, uh, I looked up your company in the phone book, and we were wondering if you, if you would contract with us. That's how God wants to bring it to us. He wants favor to be on us so that we just begin to receive from him. But we have to do it God's way. We have to begin to understand that God is a God of seed, time, and harvest, and that his way is our way. We have to accept that, and, and that doesn't come by giving grudgingly, because if we give grudgingly, then we're going to receive grudgingly. No farmer is surprised when he only gets a few stalks of corn if he only planted a few corn kernels. All right, so if we're sitting here giving when, when <laughs> Lord God, when, when, the, when the plate comes around, we give a balled up dollar and we don't know why we're not getting a harvest and Lord, why I can't make ends meet is because we're not using the processes that God has put in place in order to manifest what God says we can have. Give and it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. If we want a lot, we give a lot. If we want a little, give a little. If we've only got a little, we probably only gave a lot. It's very logical. God is not the author of confusion. So we have to understand that the word of God is very clear in what it says. And we take these concepts, like I was telling uh, the last time I talked about, these concepts are what the word of God says. And the, and the, and the world has taken these concepts and they, get, they become rich. They become millionaires off of it. And we are still sitting here counting pennies, uh, trying to spread out. Uh, our tithe and try to say, Lord, I'm going to pay all my bills. And then if I have enough left over, I'm going to pay my tithe. And we wonder why we're not prosperous. It's very, very logical. Again, there are things, you know, if you get to the point where you're barely making ends meet, check your black box and that will show you. Have you paid tithes? Well, not in a year. Have you done what the word of God says concerning giving? You know, if I want part of a uh, pastor's anointing, I need to sow into his life. If I want part of that, you know, that's how I sow. That's how I give. That's how I harvest because I sow into what I want. I praise God I was allowed to sow into somebody's uh, life. We, we sowed into somebody's life for a car and God blessed us with a car yesterday. God is a keeper. He is a promise keeper. We cannot prove him now and here with and see when he open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we will not have room enough to receive. He just wants somebody who will be bold enough to say, well, whatever, what's the worst that could happen? What if I get blessed? What if he actually prospers me more than what I believe that he could? What if he blows my mind? I have nothing to lose trusting in God. God is more faithful than any bank, any job, anything. God is more faithful. Step out on faith. Walk on water. He's going to catch you. The beautiful thing about Peter, when he stepped out on water, he walked out and he began to sink. But do you know how he got back to that boat? Jesus walked him right back to that boat on the water. He didn't say, boat, come over here. He didn't carry him in his arms. He walked with him back on the water. So all we have to do, just try him. Step out on water and see, won't God open up the windows of heaven? See, won't he do exactly what he said he will do? We, he just wants people to believe, uh, to try and believe the word for what it says, to resist the doctrines of men. Yes, that's what everybody does. Yes, that's the way they do it all the time. But was it working then? If it's not working for you, I'm not going to try it. I'm sorry. I'm going to try what the word of God says because I trust him. I trust him. I know that he is a God of his promises. I know that he's going to be a promise keeper. So that's what we stand on the word of God and we believe. And we are going to see in this church the manifestation of the promises of God. We're going to see in this church the manifestation, manifestation of the blessings of God. I see you, Pastor. I hear you up there. You have gotten so bold in your message. It is a blessing to hear you stand and declare what we have in Christ. It is a beautiful thing. And you can't sit there and keep hearing that I'm supposed to prosper and I'm supposed to be blessed and not let that change you. You can't keep hearing that and say that, you know, I, we serve a God of abundance, but we barely want to give and we barely want to sow and we're worried about what, if, what happens if. And what if, I, that's not my business. My bills belong to God. If it, you know, there are opportunities that God has, but we don't move with the, whoever pays the most money because that's not my source. God is my source. And I know that all I have to do is sow a seed and he will give me a hundredfold harvest if I sow in good ground. We take these concepts and we make the word of God manifest and we will see God show it so strong in our lives. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.